Pope Francis once said, how good it is for us when the Lord unsettles our lukewarm and superficial lives. Through the ages and across cultures, the church has historically either been in tension with the culture around it, even to the point of, of course, persecution at times, or in lockstep with mainstream culture, enjoying widespread acceptance in society. Of course, everything in between those extremes at various points along the way. And one of the mantras of the, the church of the modern era, at least in the Western world, has been a popular call for the church to transform the culture, to attempt to make the secular culture around us more like the Christian culture we create in our churches and families and circle of friends. The problem with that is Jesus didn't call us to make a better culture. He called us to make disciples. And so the mission we're called to is focused on human souls, not human culture. Because when we focus on culture instead of souls, first of all, we lose sight of the mission to make disciples. And secondly, listen, inevitably, the church ends up looking far more like the culture than the other way around. Because the further down that road we go, eventually we reach a state of consonance, harmony, between the church and the secular culture, which can seem like a good thing, right? To figure out a way to make the world approve of us, to like us, so we're not at odds. But it doesn't work because it's counter to our mission because consonance always leads to conformity. The more we try to bring the church into a state of harmony with the culture around it, the more the church begins to look like the culture around it. And the more the church looks like the culture around it, the less effective the church becomes at making disciples. If, if you were here uh, last week or watching online, you just heard our missionary guest, Abraham Liu from China, tell us that for many years the underground church in China was under heavy persecution. He talked about being arrested personally multiple times, about their home being monitored around the clock by the police. He talked about his wife being arrested and beaten in his words and his words until she was half dead. Woke up for 41 nights after that straight screaming, right? The church in China was under heavy persecution and he said it was thriving, spreading like wildfire until the economy went through a period of exponential growth a few years ago, and he said as the economy went up, persecution of the church went down. And as persecution went down, the church became more and more comfortable in society, and at the same time, less and less effective at making disciples. Why? Because when people come to Christ, they're looking for a change. They want their life to change. They want something different than what they already have, but when the church looks exactly like the culture around it, there's no reason for someone who's looking for a change to look to the church because it's no different than what they already have. Right? Listen, we've either been transformed by the gospel or we haven't. If, if we have been truly transformed, then it will be obvious to everyone that we're different, changed. Not like the lost world we're living in, but different which will, by the way, repel some people and it will attract others. I've shared this research with you before from one of my favorite scholars, Nancy Piercy, where she studied the growth of the church from its inception to present day. And one of the consistent trends that she discovered was that every time the church was in tension with the culture around it, it flourished. While in every period where there was consonance, harmony between the church and the culture around it, <clears throat> church growth flatlined, and the longer that consonance existed, the more the church began to decline. Here's a quote from that research. She says, it is a common assumption that in order to survive, churches must accommodate to the age. But in fact, the opposite is true. In every historical period, the religious groups that grow most rapidly are those that set believers at odds with the surrounding culture. As a general principle, the higher a group's tension with mainstream society, the higher its growth rate. And so historically, when the church is not focused on transforming culture through appeasement, in other words, when we're not trying to make the world approve of us, like us, that's when the church makes disciples most effectively, when the church is actually counter culture, because that is attractive to people who are seeking a change in their lives. Again, if, if someone is searching for something different in their life, 
something new, something that isn't already what they have. Why would they run to the church if the church looks exactly like the world they're already living in? So when the, when the church looks just like the world, I'm talking about us, when we look just like the world, I'm not talking about aesthetics, by the way, I'm talking about our message, when we adapt the message of the gospel to be as palatable to the world, as acceptable and least offensive as possible so that people will like what we have to say, then we're no longer making disciples of Jesus Christ. We're just trying to make people approve of us, to make people like us, which has become so common in this present church age that we've created an entirely new category of the faith, one that we refer to as lukewarm Christianity, where you can simply believe that something is true without actually having to commit yourself to it and still be a Christian. That is a grave mistake. It's what we talked about two weeks ago, that believing in Jesus and following Jesus are two different things. You can believe in him and still not be a follower of his. It's belief without conviction, it's, it's faith without change, it's religion without rebirth, it's religious creed without power, it's affiliation without transformation. And it in no way, shape, or form fits the description of any true follower of Christ in the Bible, not one. In fact, that phrase, or even the idea of someone being a lukewarm Christian, you understand that isn't even in the Bible. That is, in fact, a title that we have made up based on Revelation 3, 15 and 16, which we'll see today as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the book of Revelation in what is the third installment of a three-part sermon covering chapters two and three where Jesus issued five warnings for the church. He wrote seven letters and in there, there are five warnings to the church. So let's pick the story up where we left off last time and see what Jesus has to say to the church about the difference between those who know lots of information about him and those who have actually been transformed by him. We'll begin where we left off at Revelation chapter three, verses seven through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Founded between 189 B.C. when the, uh, the region came under the control of Eumenes in 138 B.C. when uh, Adelus Philadelphus died. Between those two times, uh, Philadelphia, it was named after Adelus Philadelphus, by the way, became known as the city of brotherly love because of Adelus's great love for his loyalty for his older sibling, or at least that's the story, uh, and he'd become known for that. That city was 30 miles southeast of Sardis, remember from last week on the main trade route uh, from Smyrna on the coast to the east. It was also along the major uh, Roman postal road from Troas that passed through uh, Pergamum, Sardis, and then Philadelphia. So it was, it was this ideal location uh, for commerce. Um, it was known as the gateway to the east. And because of its extremely fertile volcanic soil, it was ideal for growing grapes for wine, which made Philadelphia also agriculturally prosperous as well. In fact, its patron deity was Dionysus god of wine. It was also uh, remarkable for its sheer number of temples and religious festivals, and we actually have uh, ancient inscriptions that describe a significant synagogue there as well, Jewish synagogue. And just as we saw in Smyrna in chapter 2, believers in Philadelphia were experiencing great conflict with the, uh, the local synagogue, the church in the synagogue. So the Jewish population, of course, was convinced that because of their national identity and religious heritage that they were alone, the people of God, even though the Apostle Paul 
alluding to Deuteronomy 36, taught us that no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, Romans 2, 28 and 29. It was the church that was now to be called the Israel of God, Galatians 6, 16, because of course the Jewish nation had forfeited that privilege through disbelief. And so Jesus says members of the local synagogue may claim to be Jews, but that very claim constitute them, uh, constitutes them as liars. He says, and by their slander and persecution of Christians, they've shown themselves to be the synagogue of Satan. It's harsh. And of course, uh, in John 8, 44, Jesus said to the hostile and unbelieving Jews, you belong to your father, the devil. Right? Little wonder their synagogue, he calls it the synagogue of Satan in Revelation 2, 9. And because of their willingness to compromise God's word in their own lives, the Jews uh, had gained favor, uh, consonants, harmony, with the pagan culture around them. They were willing to compromise God's word in their lives. To the local Gentiles, the Jews in their synagogue were just one more religious temple among many. And of course, the city is prospering. And just as our missionary Abraham Liu told us, as the prosperity increased, uh, the persecution decreased, right? Pressure from the secular culture against the religious culture decreased because everyone was comfortable and happy to, to share and mix ideas and beliefs. No one challenged anyone. Everyone was happy except the Christian community, the church at Philadelphia, because they refused to compromise the message of the gospel. They were determined to stand firm in their faith and their testimony to Jesus Christ and his word. They carefully attended to God's word in their lives, and it set them at odds with the surrounding community, especially the Jewish religious community, who again were more than willing to compromise their faith for the sake of comfort and ease that living in such a prosperous city afforded them. And as a result, the Jews were disassociating themselves with the Christian church as fast as they could because they didn't want the Roman government or the pagan culture to connect them with these Christ followers who were telling everyone they could that Jesus was the only way to eternal life and that their prosperity was temporary and that they must repent of their sin and turn from their compromising lives and follow Christ alone. Which of course didn't sit well with a lot of people, people who were happy with their lives. To them, these Christians were intolerant, bigoted, and hateful for telling others there was no hope for them apart from Jesus, even though it was the truth. And so heavy persecution was being brought to bear on the church primarily by the local Jewish population who wanted nothing to do with them. Right? They didn't want the Christians to mess up the good thing they had going. And as a result, the Christians were being excommunicated from the synagogue. So Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. In other words, he says, I know that you've refuse to compromise your convictions. I know you've stood firm in the faith, and so even though the door to the synagogue has been shut to you, I've opened to you the door of my kingdom, and there is no Jew or Gentile or persecution or tribulation that can shut that door, that can keep you out of the kingdom that I have established. In fact, he says, because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. And of course, there are a lot of people who believe that Jesus' statement here, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. They believe that is proof of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Boy, do I hope they're right. I hope they're right. I have no desire to be a martyr. But the fact is, Jesus does not promise to spare believers from suffering or martyrdom. He actually guaranteed the opposite, that this world, we, his followers, are living in, that we will have tribulation, he says in John 16, 33. Listen, Jesus never promised to spare us from tribulation in this world. What he did promise believers is that he would spare us from God's wrath and to transform our martyrdom into victory, which we find later in this book in chapter six, verses 10 and 11, and chapter 12, verse 11, among other places in scripture, because listen, tribulation uh, troubles suffering. This is important that you get this. The, the, the tribulation that this world brings to bear on Christians is not the same thing as God's wrath. 
is the tribulation that God brings to bear in this world. When Jesus saves you, he's not just saving you from your sin or from the devil or from yourself. No, all throughout scripture is clear. We are being saved from God's wrath. Okay? Not the wrath of this world. Those are two very different things. The wrath of this world and God's wrath are two very different things. As followers of Christ, we are guaranteed to be spared from the wrath of God, and we are guaranteed to experience the wrath of men. In fact, in the very next verse, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Well, there would be no need to hold fast or to worry about anyone seizing your crown if there was no tribulation or persecution coming our way. He continues, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. The, the one who conquers what? The tribulation, the pressure from this world to give in, to compromise, to become just like the culture around us, just as the, the Jews were doing in mass in Philadelphia. He's saying, stand firm as you have been, because the wrath of this world that you've been experiencing is going to continue and even increase until I come and take you out of this world and spare you from my wrath. And then, then you will become a permanent part, he says, of my temple. This is Jesus addressing the part of the body of Christ who are authentic, not just believers, but followers of Jesus. It's actually the opposite of what we're about to see next. These are people who have not just believed. They've not just said a sinner's prayer at some point in their lives. These are people who have been transformed by the gospel, and how do we know? who they are, who the true followers are. Jesus says, those who've kept my word, those who have carefully attended to the word of God in their lives, as John says from the beginning of this book, okay? We've either been transformed by the gospel or we haven't. If we have, if we've been truly transformed, then it will be obvious to everyone that we are different, changed. These Christians at Philadelphia were different. They were changed and everyone in the city knew it. And guess what? They paid a price for it. And so will we. Our missionaries, Abraham and Grace Lou, paid a price for it. You understand, it's the whole point of this letter to this church. Jesus is saying, look, your testimony is authentic. Your faith is strong. Your transformation is obvious. And it's wonderful. And precisely because of those things, you are going to pay a price for being different for being mine. Okay, look, the devil doesn't persecute people who are no threat to his kingdom. Why would he? You can believe in Jesus and live a comfortable life. But if you're going to actually follow Jesus, he said there's gonna be a price to pay, not the wrath of God. We can't pay that price. But the wrath of man just what was happening to the church at Philadelphia. Doesn't mean you can't live, by the way, a, a, a fulfilling, joy-filled, productive, and blessed life here on earth. You certainly can, but it's not without a cost. I've lost deep relationships with family and friends because of my testimony to the gospel. This doesn't come without a cost. Following Jesus always comes at a price. The problem for the church is many believers are not willing to pay that price, as we'll see as we finish this chapter. Yet, interestingly enough, the very way of living that precipitates persecution in Christians' lives is also the very thing that attracts the lost people in this world to the gospel. People who are looking for a change for something different than what they already have. English theologian John Stott once said, instead of always being one of the chief bastions of the social status quo, the church is to develop a Christian counterculture with its own distinctive goals, values, standards, and lifestyle. A realistic alternative to the contemporary technocracy which is marked by bondage, materialism, self-centeredness, and greed. Christ's call to obedience is a call to be different, not conformist. Such a church, joyful, obedient, loving, and free, will do more than please God. It will attract the world. It is when the church evidently is the church and is living a supernatural life of love by the power of the Holy Spirit that the world will believe. Let's finish the story for today. Verse 14 to the end of the chapter. 
And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I'm rich, I've prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me in my throne. And I also conquered as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, Laodicea lay in Fergia's Lycus Valley on the banks of the Lycus River. It was 11 miles west of Colossae and six miles south of uh, Heropolis. And it was a city of great wealth and great resources, a commerce, uh, commercial center. It was thriving, particularly in the medical and textile industries. In fact, in AD 60, there was a massive earthquake there, and yet the city declined all imperial disaster relief from the Roman government because they were so self-sufficient, they were so prepared, they had so many resources, they didn't need uh, government help from the outside of the city for almost anything. And so as a result, the city did not see itself as poor, blind, and naked, just the opposite. And neither did the church. You say, I'm rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. There's also evidence of a strong Jewish presence, uh, presence in Laodicea, and equally strong evidence that they had blended Greek pagan culture into their own Jewish uh, religious culture in many respects. In fact, by the third century, there were illustrations stamped on coins that mixed together Jewish and pagan versions of the flood stories. It's just one example. And, and the church, the Christian church, was beginning to accept the same practices and temptations. And so they too were very proud of their culture, their church culture, and the blending of religious beliefs that brought consonants, harmony with them and the pagan culture around them. And so with that cooperation, they had become quite proud of their self-sufficiency except for one very important resource that was lacking, the quality of their water. And by the way, everyone knew it. In fact, Laodicea was famous for its bad water. We have ancient records that tell us it was full of sediment. Uh, excavations of the city's terracotta pipes have revealed thick lime deposits, and there were heavy lime deposits on the waterfall cliff just opposite the city. It was a constant reminder to them and anyone who would go there of the heavy contamination of their own water supply. And the Lycus River that the city sat next to was no better. Its waters were muddy and completely undrinkable. And so to solve the problem, the city had a system of aqueducts built that piped water in from two other cities. About six miles to the north, again, was the city of Heropolis, and had and still has, by the way, to this day, these wonderful hot springs full of minerals that bubbled up from the ground, which were used therapeutically, like a hot tub. And so one set of aqueducts piped the hot water in from Heropolis, except that by the time the water traveled the six miles to Laodicea, it was no longer hot. It was lukewarm at that point. And so the therapeutic benefit of the water being hot was lost because it was so rich in, in minerals. It also made people sick when they tried to drink it. And so about 11 miles away to the southeast was the town of Colossae, which was famous for the cold alpine streams that flowed down into it from the nearby snow-capped Mount Cadmus, and that water was really wonderful for drinking. And so Laodicea had a set of aqueducts that piped in this very cold water from Colossae, except that after traveling 11 miles through the Turkish heat, the cold water was lukewarm by the time it reached Laodicea. And so Laodicea had become famous for its lukewarm water, which was useless for drinking and useless for therapeutic purposes. This is what Jesus was comparing the church to. He was saying, I wish that you were either hot or cold. 
Either one of those options would be wonderful and useful, but because you're lukewarm, just like your water, I will spit you out of my mouth. And by the way, the word spit in verse 16 is far too polite uh, because the actual word in the ancient Greek, emeo, it means to vomit. So Jesus is literally saying here, if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth, just like your water makes people vomit when they drink it. Keep in mind, he's talking to people in the church, but he's not talking about Christians. Of course, this is not a passage we teach much anymore because it makes people very uncomfortable. We want people to like us, to like our message, to approve of us, so we don't teach this a lot anymore. But listen, we better teach it with honesty and conviction because as unpopular of a message as it may be, it's the only one we were given to deliver to lost people lukewarm people in the church. In fact, that phrase, even the idea of lukewarm Christian isn't in the Bible. That's a title that we have made up based on this passage of scripture. So we refer to these people. You've probably heard this growing up in church that Jesus is describing as lukewarm Christians, but that's not what Jesus said. He didn't say they were Christians at all. No, in fact, he went on to say they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Blind means they were spiritually lost. These are people that he says he's going to vomit out of his mouth. He's not describing Christians. We have interpreted the cold people Jesus was describing as the non-believers and the hot being the committed Christians with the lukewarm people being Christians who aren't quite as committed as those who are hot or quite as lost as those who are cold. That's not what Jesus was saying at all. For that matter, nowhere else in all of scripture does Jesus or anyone else ever describe a state of religious belief where you can exist somewhere between being lost and being found. No, you're either spiritually alive or you're spiritually dead. There is no in between. We've either been transformed by the gospel or we haven't. In our modern, comfortable Christian culture, we've created a whole new branch of Christianity, a whole new sect of believers called lukewarm Christians. It's just something we've made up. It's cultural Christianity, people who populate the church believing in Jesus but refusing to follow him. And so he issues a final warning, five progressive warnings to the church, each one leading to the next, which we've been covering, of course, over the past few weeks. The first was abandoning your first love which we found in the church at Ephesus in chapter two. The second was following false teaching. If you're taking notes, that's point two, which is happening in the church at Pergamum. The third was open rebellion, right? Open sin against God and his word by people who say they're followers of Christ, which was happening at Thyatira. The fourth was a warning about spiritually dying, which is what was happening to the church at Sardis, which leads us to the fifth and final warning to the church at Laodicea, a warning that the church is becoming apostate. The word apostasy comes from the Greek word apostasia. It means a rebellion, an abandonment, or breach of faith. It's the same word Paul uses uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, when talking about the church in these last days we're living in. He says, now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion, apostasia, comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Paul prophesied apostasy in the church before Christ's return. Jesus says it was happening in the church then uh, in Laodicea, and the truth is it continues to threaten the body of Christ today. And out of that came the rise of what we know today as cultural Christianity, which is what probably many of us here were raised in. And the problem with cultural Christianity is that it breeds in its followers a fundamental misunderstanding, a, a misinterpretation really of the church, of what the church is and how it functions in society and what the consequences are for being a part of it. In fact, the name itself, cultural Christianity is misleading because of course it's not Christianity at all. Look, it, if our message never offends anyone, if our testimony of what Christ has done in our lives never gets challenged by anyone, 
If our witness to the gospel at work inside of us never gets noticed by anyone, then what kind of gospel are we following? Because listen, the gospel of Christ is subversive by nature. It's disruptive, which means the message of the church is subversive, which means our mission to the culture around us is subversive. In other words, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to live our lives against the grain of the rest of society. We're supposed to live our lives in a way that doesn't make any sense to an unbelieving world. The Apostle Peter said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light once you were not a people. Now... You're God's people, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. We are God's people. And being one of God's people means being called out of the ways of this world by him to live a different kind of life. Right? A different kind of life than the one you would live if you were not one of his people. We're supposed to be different, called out, set apart. You've either been transformed by the gospel or you haven't. This is God's expectation for his people, for each one of us to live our lives called out by him and set apart for him, that it necessarily, uh, that is necessarily what happens in the life of someone who's been truly transformed by the gospel. You're set apart from the rest of the population, not separated, but set apart or set in contrast with everyone else, why? so that it would be blatantly obvious to those who don't follow Christ, who the followers of Christ actually are, and just how different life is when you choose to follow him. Because look, the more we try to bring the church into a state of consonance, harmony with the culture around it, the more the church begins to look like the culture around it, and the more the church looks like the culture around it, the less effective the church becomes at making disciples. Right? Why would anyone who is not a part of the church be interested in the life of the church when it looks just like the life they already have? It is of the utmost importance for every follower of Jesus Christ to understand what your life is supposed to look like when you're called out by God because it's decidedly not the same life you had before. It's different. Living for Jesus doesn't look the same as living for yourself. It's different. Being called out by God is more than simply believing in Jesus Christ and then hanging out with your Christian friends on Sundays. It's living an entirely different kind of life, one that makes no sense to the unbeliever. And listen, nobody here gets a free pass. There isn't one single Christian on this planet who God looked at and said, yeah, I created all these people and I called them out to serve a great purpose on this earth, except you. You're the exception. For you, it's enough to just believe in me and maybe hang out with some other Christians on Sundays. No, there isn't one example of that in all of Scripture. Every single one of us has been called out to live a different kind of life, different to the point than when people encounter us, there should never be any doubt in their minds that we are followers of Jesus Christ because it is unmistakably clear by simply watching how we live and behave and talk and conduct our daily lives that we're different than everyone else. And it's easy, uh, by the way, to blame the church as an organization for that. I hear it all the time. I've done it myself. It's easy to blame the church organization for looking too much like the secular church today, right? It's much harder to take a long, honest look at ourselves individually in the mirror and then consider how our lives, how my life is actually different, if at all, from the rest of the world. It's easy to blame the lights and the guitars and the clothes and the way the room, it's easy to blame all of that stuff. It's a lot harder to look at yourself in the mirror. By the way, I'm talking to you from experience. I'm talking to myself, but that's what we need to do because it's not the organization of the church or its structure or size or whether we meet in big buildings or in people's houses or whether we have fancy lights or not. It's none of those things that separate us from the rest of the world. No, it's how each of us live our lives. That's what separates the church from the rest of the world. The fact is, listen, the church looks just like the world when we look just like the world. 
But God called us out of the world to be different, to be transformed. We've either been transformed by the gospel or we haven't. You say, I'm rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. White garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, you hear his heart? You see where this is coming from. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent because I love you. He's talking to people in the church, to people who believe that God is pleased with how they're living their lives because at some point they made some kind of profession of faith when in reality he says, I'm gonna vomit you out of my mouth because although you may believe in me, you've never followed me. It's clear these professing believers thought what they were offering to God was acceptable, which is why he's warning them and by default to us to begin with. Remember, he says to the churches, these are to all the churches, just answer this one question uh, of yourself, okay, to yourself honestly. If I woke up tomorrow and I was no longer a Christian, how different would my life look tomorrow than it does today? I mean, aside from attending church with the, the people who know you, would the people who know you, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, your neighbors and friends and family, would it be glaringly obvious that something drastic, something profound had changed in your life overnight? Or would your life basically look the same tomorrow as it does today? Just go through your daily routine in your mind. What would be different? What would change about where you would go? who you would see, how you would talk, what you would say, how you would spend your money and your time and your resources, or would it all basically look the same? Because listen, if the answer, if the honest answer is my life wouldn't look all that different tomorrow as a non-Christian than it does today as a Christian, then maybe it's time for you to ask yourself another question. Not just do I believe in Jesus, but am I actually following him? Have I been transformed by the gospel? Because that's exactly what he's calling you to. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers. I will grant him to sit with me in my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray.